There we go. <laughs> All right. Cheers, Kevin. Cheers. Clink, Good to clink. see you. Clink, clink. So where are we and what are we drinking? Are you supposed to say welcome to the show and shit? You're already hammered? <laughs> I'm not already hammered. <laughs> I just feel like in my current state of mind and affairs of skipping the preamble, skipping all the foreplay. Going straight in. You just know, if my, audience, <laughs> if my audience has been with me for 700 of these, I'm like, you know, you guys are probably pretty limbered up by now. It's limbered? <laughs> <laughs> limbered up. Love it. Yeah. Welcome to the Tim Ferriss Show, everybody. This is a special edition, random show. It's been a few months at least. I know. It's good to see you. We're, yeah. we're actually next to each other. I know. If you're watching the video, we are sitting next to each other on yeah. my floor, which is, is crazy. Yeah. This is old school. I like it. Yeah. In front of a recording couch. Does my audio sound weird to you or listen to this? Yeah. It sounds weird to you. Test one, two, three. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Does that sound weird? Watch. See? Talk, talk, talk. Talk, 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 talk. You sound good, right? Doesn't sound weird. You okay. don't you don't sound weird. Okay, sweet. Actually, yeah, you know, when I get close, you're pretty close. Yeah. If I talk right now, I'm yeah. getting a huge gain blowback on my voice, but not yours. Oh, interesting. So maybe it's just a just like the a, headphone thing? Yeah. All right. Sorry, people. <laughs> We're gonna leave all that in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. <laughs> people, just, people will be like, what the fuck are these guys doing? All right. I'm investing in tequila, folks, not in editing. <laughs> just kidding. Half. All right. So, so we are actually in my new apartment in Los Angeles. We're sitting on the floor in front of a, a little table here. Yeah, I'm in LA now. I moved. Why did you move to LA? So, you know... A lot of things going on. Because since COVID, everybody from LA has moved to Austin. Is that true? <laughs> I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people have moved. I know a lot of people have moved to Austin. <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where I was in Portland, Oregon for a few years. Loved it. Beautiful. Beautiful place. Rains a lot. Not a lot of friends. Yep. And so it was hard because we were in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, it's, it's, it's actually just kind of depressing. Like yeah. rain and no friends with COVID <laughs> combined. Now, when you moved there, I have to say, I was like, who does Kevin know? In that area. Yeah. I, I knew a couple people and one of them moved and I had a couple of the friends and then one of them had a baby and you know, with COVID and everything, you're like, you don't get yeah. around the new baby and all yeah. that stuff. So right. it was tough, but my family was out there. My mom's out there, you know, my sister's mm -hmm. uh, still out there and just decided, Hey, let's get away from them. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> you know, honestly, with all the <laughs> NFT stuff going on and the majority of my calls were either LA or New York that I was having work wise. Yeah. And so why not get down to where everything is happening? And so the choice, you know, I, we weren't going to go to New York cause it's just winter time, New York. You've already done New York also. And I have two kids and it's like yeah. New York's hard, harder with kids, but yeah. So LA, why is New York harder with kids? I mean, when the snow is like three I feet see. deep I and it. like the winters, the winters and you know, it's, there's also traffic. Like I remember when I was out in New York and I was watching, <laughs> I'm just laughing because I just spent three hours in traffic no, driving from San Diego to Los Angeles. There's a it's difference. fucking terrible. There's a difference between <laughs> like LA stop and go freeway traffic. And like you're watching these kids. And I saw this happen where they make them all hold hands when they're crossing the street, of course. Yeah. And then like a taxi comes flying around, you know, at a, a million miles an hour and almost like wipes out a, a, a I, I'm just, I just kind of freak out. Yeah. When, when you have the dad hat on with the kids, I'm like, I don't want to have to worry about uh, that see. stuff. Right. Got it. And so this is, I, and I know there's more neighborhoody stuff and there's, there's areas of New York where we definitely could have made it work, but I don't know. West coast. I'm, I'm still, my mom, you know, she's up there. She's in her eighties. She's undergoing cancer treatments. I want to be on this coast. I can yeah. bounce up in a second if I need to. So, you know, made sense. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. So sitting on the floor with a beverage in what are you hand. Drinking? That's a great question because this is something of yours. I am keeping it simple and having some tequila. Missing a little bit of Texas, perhaps. Dos Artes, 100% agave blanco. I wanted something that would maybe be less likely to donkey punch me in the head hangover-wise. And so I chose this as much for... The Beautiful Blanco, bottle, right? as for the bottle itself, I mean, the actual ceramic 
container is gorgeous. This is one of our, our favorite tequilas. I got to say a big thank you to Anish, who introduced me to this tequila, bought me a bottle of this as a birthday, birthday gift or something. It just blew my mind. So really good. Not, not crazy expensive, I like middle of the road kind of yeah. world, but just awesome tequila. Yeah, I have no idea. Just for the bottle alone, I'm imagining this costs a fair amount to make. Just true for a lot of the premium alcohols. Like you're paying 20% of the price or 30% of the price for the glass or the crystal right. or whatever you're actually not keeping, most likely. So what are you drinking? I am having a little bit of champagne uh, just because my wife bought a bottle and we opened it. Uh, <laughs> I am drinking a really douchey champagne. It's it's not douchey, but it's like... Is, can I just say that on your podcast? Yeah, you can say whatever you want. Okay, so it, it's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the funny thing. Dari came back from from the champagne store, which <laughs> the grocery store, and she she was like, "I I saved three hundred dollars," and I'm like, "Cool, what'd you get?" We don't ever drink this champagne, but there was apparently a sale on something called Ace of Spades, which is Jay Z's champagne. It's actually quite good. It's actually quite good. Well, so, I was just laughing because as soon as you mentioned that before we were recording, and I was like, "And you also have." A red wine with Snoop Dogg's face on it. <laughs> Next That's your sink. I'm like, what is it? Tupac, uh, Listen, you know, grass fed butter. What's that? So we, What's we, coming? So they're not too far away from us is a grocery store that basically has Snoop Dogg's wine. And it's like kind of like a table wine. And, and Daria needs it for cooking. So she bought Snoop Dogg's. It was like a six, it was like, well, I think $10 bottle of wine. <laughs> I don't judge the cost of Snoop Dogg's <laughs> table wine. I just thought, I thought there were going to be, there was going to be more to that, yeah, that pattern. That's it, basically. And how is it? Mm. It's quite good. Well, Very dry. Um, fantastic. So cheers. cheers. Good, to, good see to see you, see you man. man. Yeah, it's been a long time since we've done one of these in person. I know. It reminds me of the old school episodes that we, we used, used to, to do these the all the time in San Francisco. Yeah. And even with the glass background it makes me think of one of your places mm -hmm. in san francisco totally where all those people showed up angry no well, the protesters the protesters yeah I that place that that particular place have you been protested yet <laughs> i have not been protested yet that's interesting <laughs> yeah well i i think that's gonna happen actually with your uh, secret I'm, thing you're working on oh god i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> people's imaginations are gonna go wild with what horrible thing i'm concocting but I have not been protested. I'll take the counterpoint. And this is, I don't want to give him credit because I don't know if he would want it, but a friend of mine who has this theory, and I tend to agree with it, that people are going to be 10% less famous every year if they're already a public figure. If they're not in rapid ascension, if they're not exploding, and even if they are, if we go over a longer time frame, like it's one thing to be popular on TikTok for a month. You're on TikTok, right? I'm not. It's quite a different thing to oh, be shit. popular for like 10 years on 20 years. Yeah. And I just think that is going to become harder and harder to do. Because there'll be more of a pool of people that'll be... Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the internet is just... I mean, just the young kids coming up on you. Yeah, and I'm okay with it. I'm tired. Are you done? I think I'm like that NHL player where they're like, oh, wow, yeah, no, God, given how many injuries he's had, he's doing pretty well out there, limping along on the ice. Yeah, but oh, let, me, let me ask God you. God bless him. He's okay. giving it a good college try. Have, have another, I don't want to be that have guy. Have another sip of tequila, because I have a serious question to ask you here. Okay. Tell me, that was a really intense sip on the microphone. It was like... <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't wear a headset. Okay. I don't have to worry okay. about it. It was very intense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So you don't want to go for Rogan. You want to take him out. Like you could, you could, you could go for it. No, he's won. He's Is he won. won? Oh, for sure. He's won. Yeah. No, it doesn't even enter my mind. Honestly, really? does not even, enter you would have mind. to have like a live studio and shit. Cause Ooh. cause a lot of it has to do with that. Like live. Oh, for presence. sure. I mean, yeah. he is a, he's a television professional. I mean, he's very yeah. good interviewer. He's a very good commentator. He's very comfortable in front of a camera and is an excellent storyteller. Yeah. He's, he's got to be five to 10 times bigger than his runner up in terms Who's of size up? for interview format podcast. You got to be up there. I'm with up him. there. I mean, I'm up there, but you have to understand that the, there's, there's Rogan. And then there's like, if it were the tour de France, there'd be like one guy, 10 miles ahead. Yeah. And then there'd be a pack of, he's like, like the guy on roids. Then there'd be four. <laughs> no, okay. I don't mean he's on yeah. roids. I mean like in terms of his, is like how far ahead he is. 
Yes. I mean, it, it's, it's as if you then have a cohort of folks, there are like four or five maybe, who are like spread out over 200 yards. And so there is maybe a popularity sequence to it, but they're 10 miles behind yeah. the person in, in first place. So I don't even, I don't think about uh, competing at all in that sense. The other thing though, too, is like, I feel like his content, he's really good yeah, at great. getting the spicy shit on, right? Like yeah. he'll have the spicy guest on. He knows how to push the buttons. And I feel like you have kind of like not, I mean, you, you have like fantastic intellectual conversations, but I don't know that you push the, the agenda of like normal celebrity for the sake of like no. stirring up the pot a bit, you know? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't have the endurance for it. And he, he's, he really enjoys so many different formats. He, yeah. he is Joe Rogan, meaning Joe Rogan is the best version of Joe Rogan. And I think anyone who looks at what Joe does and says, I'm going to do that and I'm going to do that better and I'm going to be bigger is foolish. I think that's yeah, a terrible that's idea. Yeah, no shit. And Joe has tremendous endurance, I think, in part because he has chosen formats and ways of communicating and ways of presenting visually that it seems he really enjoys. Yeah. Right. So if somebody tries to force fit themselves into that game, Oh yeah. They're going to lose. Yeah. You both had Zuckerberg on the show. Yep. You maybe three months before him, four months, something like that. Behind the scenes, how much prepping do they give you of like, don't ask Mark this? Like, What's that like? They, they meaning his team, were extremely easy to deal with for me. Did and they say, like, this question is off, off limits? Like, don't ask Mark no, about his No, they didn't. Uh, I gave them, as I give every guest, final cut. So there wasn't a lot of talk about prohibited topics or anything like that. Mm. And did you go easy on him? I wouldn't say I went easy. There's something that people should know, if they don't already, about the show and deliberate decisions that, that I make so that I enjoy the format in the same way that I think Joe does it with his format. And anyone who has, I think, tremendous in podcast years longevity, which would be at least five or ten, finds the format that they're best at. It's just mm -hmm. like different shaped athletes in different sports. Yeah. And in the case of my podcast, I made the decision really early on. I don't want to have a gotcha show. There are many other people who are going to do that better than I will because they enjoy it. I don't. I don't want to be Mike Wallace, even though this is a famous interviewer. If you have not heard that name, you should actually look him up because he was a very skilled interviewer. Mm. There's a documentary about him that is fantastic and has chilling footage of him and the entire story behind interviewing the Ayatollah Khomeini. In any case, it's not hardball. It's not any of these formats. And in part that this is going to sound so cheesy and Hallmark card, but I hated going into interviews myself because you've been interviewed a ton. Mm -hmm. I've been interviewed hundreds or thousands of times at this point. And when you go in and someone just cuts an angle and is out to get some type of headline that they're going to cherry pick from a longer statement you make and mm -hmm. twist it out of context, I just didn't want anything to do with that. I wanted my show to be the show, not because it's easy necessarily, but because it's well-researched and thoughtful and not out to be aggressive for the sake of being aggressive. For all of those reasons and more, there were certain topics that I didn't bring up. And in part, that is because if it is a topic, let's just say I were to ask Zuckerberg something like, what is your stance on A, B, and C? Or how do you personally think about Russia, Ukraine, this, that, and the other thing? When that is a clear and present, high-priority area of focus within Meta, Facebook itself, he's not going to have any maneuvering ability. Do you know what I mean? He's, mm -hmm. he's going to feel, as he should, compelled to give whatever response they have jointly oh, they determined that to shit. be the yeah. right response. And so for me to throw that out, it's a waste of everyone's time and oxygen. 
Because number one, we're not going to get, and I wouldn't expect, nor would I even recommend that he give something new. And my podcast isn't live, again, for many reasons. But I think I know which trees are worth barking up and which are not. I think I'm very good at picking those shots. And if people want, let's just say, a politically oriented show or a controversy focused show or true crime or something, there are tens of thousands of podcasts, brand new ones that come out every week. You can find something you enjoy. For me, I wanted a lot of that interview, say with Mark, which I was quite happy with, will remain evergreen for a very long time. Right. So, talking about how he structures his life, thinks about priorities, how he integrates, say, belief systems like religion into his family. I mean, these are all questions that may not be the topic of the week, but that nonetheless, Mm. I think, will preserve value, maybe even appreciate in value over time Mm. as more and more people chase whatever happens to be trending that instant on TikTok or whatever the platform is. Remember Vine? I mean... Yeah, risky I, business betting on one platform. When I interviewed Elon probably 10 years or so ago, I I did the same type of approach where it was very like let's get into who you are as a person versus yeah. the topic of the day. And yeah. if you go back and watch that interview today, there's still some great evergreen pieces of content that are like lessons from just his childhood growing up, like things that lessons that he learned along the way, the idea of um taking things back to first principles, like the all that stuff was pretty new when he talked about it back then. Yeah. And it was, um, I, I'm still really proud of that interview that it, that it, it's still, you know, it still gets a lot of views and people should turn ads out on that shit. I don't have ads <laughs> on that. I can make a little, little cash on the side. That's, you know, I was going to say, Kevin, <laughs> you know, I saw you, the, the holes in your socks. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, you know, it's just breaking down. Dude. Oh, the, <laughs> all the hand-me-downs that you're wearing. That's right. Times are tough in the Rose household. So tough. <laughs> What do you think I should do with the podcast? Honestly, yeah, because I love you, I want you to move to Los Angeles and have a live show. Because <laughs> I think a live show would be because yeah. here's the question: like, I guess what I was trying to hint at with the Joe Rogan piece is that I believe when I watch Zuck on his show, and I watch a lot of people, Aaron Rodgers, and a few people that I've watched recently, the reason why he can get them to share intimate details is yeah. because of that. I mean, Aaron Rodgers is sitting there smoking a cigar on his set, right? Yep. And they're just kind of chilling out, like having fun. It's the Elon moment with the weed cigarette, you know, all that <laughs> shit. But like that, that magic can't happen remote, you know? Yeah, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder. So I don't know. I mean, I, I would, if, if, you, if you're if you going to go for it, like I'd love for you to move to LA, dude, but that's just me personally. Could have one to have you more in my orbit and hanging out more often, you know? <laughs> You know, I've thought about doing a limited edition live series. I was actually looking at it right before COVID hit. Well, you did that series, that television yeah, show, Yeah, Fearless. Right? Yeah. I, and I enjoyed that. And I would do it again. And there is a magic, a connection, also an audiovisual component, if you want to show photographs or video. Sure. That is very hard, if not impossible, to replicate It's live. the Oprah I thing. also just like having... I think having an audience is a lot of fun. Well, think about what Oprah it's did, It's like right? being an athlete and having to compete. It's going from training to competing. Yeah. And since I don't do live very often, I get a cheap thrill out of it. Yeah. Uh, but what were you saying about Oprah? Well, I was just saying that she was able to break down... I mean, a lot of the intimate stuff that came out was because they were sitting across from each other, right? You yeah. felt like you were just with her yep. at, during that moment. Why don't you do six months out of the year out here? <laughs> A little studio, a little series. It could be cool, actually. Maybe one month. (laughs) But the fact of the matter is, I moved to Austin because I wanted to leave a scene. I mean, there are tons of reasons, but... I remember you were in SF, right? Yeah. And you were just kind of getting burnt out on the shit. I was done for a couple of years before I left. And then I got there, and then COVID happened. And what I thought was going to take like five to eight years happened in 18 months. And now Austin is a scene. And it's like... Fuck. Well, because I remember one time I, talk, I talked to you and I don't know if you want to keep this in or not, but like there's one time where you're like, you moved to Austin kind of hoping to kind of like get away from that shit. Yeah. And then you're going to coffee shops. People are Tim, like, <laughs> like recognizing you and just being like, you're like, fuck, I just wanted to kind of yeah. some peace. You know, and it's, uh, 
Like you're hearing tech oh, conversations God. over coffee. It's tech. It's the tech stuff. Yeah. Because if if somebody listens to the podcast and they say hi, honestly, there are days when I need it. Like it feels yeah. good. But it's the but 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 I'll I'll paint a picture. If I'm this this like actually happened to me something very similar to this. If, however, I like spot a guy in a man bun who has more tattoos than like a Brazilian MMA fighter who's been to prison and has like an ayahuasca t-shirt on and is wearing like a Bitcoin bracelet and comes over to me and he's like, yo, bro, yeah, well, I used to listen to your stuff, but I'm more of a Lex Friedman fan. And I'm like, what is this? More of a what? Lex Friedman, who's actually a great podcaster. But somebody says this to me and I'm like, what is this interaction about? Like, this is such a bizarre interaction. That like archetype, which is at the nexus of a bunch of circles, including something called conspirituality. Whoever came up with that high five, one of the best words ever, but this like conspirituality that seems to have taken as its HQ. Austin, you started this shit. drives me cuckoo bananas. I, I did not start the conspirituality. No, but you were one of the first people I heard talking about ayahuasca and shit. Well, yeah, that's true. And then as soon as something as as soon as something is popular enough that people are doing it because it's popular, then I'm I'm like I want to just exit stage left. Yeah, I saw this piece in the New York Post about socialites using ayahuasca to do God knows what, and it's just the same status bullshit. The cars, the good the goodies that you show to your friends, like all the status stuff that drives me completely nuts. And look, I'm sure I play some of those games myself because we're human and we all play some of those games. I don't know that you do. Like I know you pretty well. I've never seen you drive a crazy car. No. You always have shitty cars. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. It's true. And yeah, I don't, in that way, I don't play any of those games uh, or I try not to. And your houses have always been very reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. They're modest. You know? Uh, you have a I, private jet, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, aside from my fleet of golf, <laughs> golf, golf streams, streams. Yeah, exactly. uh, I'm very reasonable. So as soon as, especially with the psychedelic stuff, God, it makes me like so sad on some level that like the fucking monkeys can't help, but like soil their own home over and over again. It's just like, Oh guys, come on. Like this one thing. Can we not turn this into like a kicking it with the Kardashians, keeping up with whoever the hell is your next door neighbor? And uh, because, like, my instead of this sort of sideways glance, making sure that someone has noticed your hot new like Bugatti, now it's like, oh, oh, well, you had a good shaman experience. Let me tell you about my shaman. And it's like, oh, oh it's the same jerking off. It's the same yeah. stupid game. And um, I've still never done the uh, the actual ayahuasca. I got to do that one time with you. I'd love to. Yeah, we can talk about it. We can talk about it. I mean, I... I know you'd give me the authentic shit. I don't want yeah. that like bullshit. I'm gonna go. If I'm gonna get do it, let's go in. <laughs> I'm just gonna be like, hold on, let me hop on Craigslist, find yeah. somebody good. <laughs> give me exactly. a second. Casual encounters. Does that make sense? I don't know how they're advertising these days. I will say, just as a quick note, with with ayahuasca specifically, I talk so many more people out of using. Well, this is broadly speaking, out of using psychedelics than I have ever talked into using psychedelics. I think that's something that a lot of folks listening may not realize that I mostly disqualify or discourage people from doing ayahuasca or any psychedelic. It just depends a lot on the specifics for me because these things are so strong Mm -hmm. and they can be, they can be incredibly destabilizing. Yeah. I've been there. And after I did that high dose mushrooms, very amazing experience and definitely therapy, like a shit ton, like they tell you all compressed in this little thing. But for two or three days after I was just kind of like, Ooh, the motions were all over the place. You know, it's yeah. like, it's not just smooth sailing from the second you get done, you know, no, no. the chemicals are got to rebalance and shit. Yeah. And you're, you're increasing plasticity. So if you take, like you just imagine that you have like this huge, let's just say, Maybe not huge, like volleyball-sized ball of Play-Doh 
and you have to heat it to be able to shape it. And that's your brain. And then you heat it. And depending on all the inputs and stimuli, positive and negative, that enter your life or that you allow to enter your life over the subsequent handful of days or even weeks, will shape how that dries. Mm. And it's not automatically for the better. So long way of, of saying uh, definitely do your homework. This stuff has become so popular and I'm excited about the therapeutic potential. I'm excited about the potential for examining in ways that have been effectively impossible before for a lot of technological reasons. We will begin to ask and answer questions about the mind and consciousness itself that we have not even been able to scratch the surface of in uh, you know, even even twenty years ago, I think I think psychiatry is going to fundamentally change in a lot of really core ways, right? I mean, fundamental core kind of redundant, but you get the idea that that some of the tectonic plates under which psychiatry rests currently are going to mm-hmm. shift very dramatically, and I'm excited about that. Yeah, sounds great. I'm I'm uh, speaking of which, you kind of we haven't even hit any of our topics that we're going to talk about today. <laughs> well, let me ask you before we move on. Yeah, like, well, it, it was going to be in line with that, but it, yeah, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Now that you gave me one quarter of a drink, yeah. I'm, on a, I'm, on, I'm on. I love it. I'm on a roll. Uh, I may or may not have had some other chocolates. Uh, oh, that's right. <laughs> a little chocolate before we got started. But, I did not have that. But in any case, that ayahuasca chocolate. Well, oh god, I'm just kidding, that I'm would kidding. be the most. The fat, that would be like <laughs> cat shit sandwich. It is like the flavor <laughs> that comes to mind. All right, why would you want to do say ayahuasca? What would uh, what would the the pull be potentially? Well, I mean, for me, I I have had a few experiences on on psychedelics that every drug that you take is a little bit different, right? Like mm-hmm. you have a different door open, right? Yep. Like high dose weed is going to feel di- very different than high dose mushrooms because it's going yep. to feel very different than microdosed acid, which I'm just talking about the things that I've I've tried. So I imagine there's another door to open there. Boofing ketamine, different door. Ketamine very different. I've done I've done ketamine before in a therapeutic setting, and it was it was it was actually the most pleasant like chill thing I've ever done. Like it's just, like just chill, you know. <laughs> Watch out for the long term brain damage if you guys ever do it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll get into that in another episode. Yeah. So you know, for me, I'm trying to figure out, and this is on onto my first point about my my seven day retreat that I'm going to do. Well, that, was, that was a good head fake. Did you answer my question? No, no, no. What I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying is that I, I want to I wanna open as many doors as possible during this lifetime. Like, uh, why not? You know? Yeah, okay. All right. Hey. It's not to say I'm going to go and in, in, in stick to one door and be down that path for the next you know yeah. six months, but why not just try it? Like, I'm going to be dead in 40 years. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> despite, despite all the people yeah. skipping lunch and dinner in yeah, hopes exactly. of eking out an extra three years. So you were going to segue... Opening doors. Yeah. And? You know, the problem, Tim, I, I have with a lot of these compounds is that I, I feel like they're very prescriptive. And I worry that, you know, you get these, you get these changes. Don't get me wrong. And, and granted, I don't have as much data as you do on this, on this front. But for me, I felt this like nice relief for like a month, you know? Yeah. And then it kind of creeps back in to, to the normal steady state of, right. of the things, right? Yeah. And so the plasticity, I, I wonder, is it like something that you have to do multiple times and like how many times? And then, then on, the, on the worst case of this, you hear about these people that they just don't ever come back. And they're, they're yeah. lifelong journeyers that are they, yeah. they, these yeah, you know, psychonauts that, and you're like, are yeah. you killing more brain cells? Are you really re- reworking the plastic there? Are you just kind of like, you know? Yeah. yeah, or you took that Play-Doh and just like, just threw it down a sand dune. <laughs> exactly. You know? So for me, I've been, you know, I've, we've mentioned this many times on the show is like, I, I love uh, the meditation side of things. I think of it as a kind of a trying to reach the same peak, but in a more kind of steady state, like every day, a micro dose way that eventually over a decade or longer of practice, you'll eventually get to some amazing state of consciousness. I'm obviously not there yet, but I'm doing my first seven day silent retreat at uh, Mountain Cloud Zen Center, which I'm very excited. That's to Henry's do. place. Henry's place, yeah. yeah. Henry Shookman, yeah. Nice, fantastic teacher. So, why do this retreat? What are you hoping to gain from it? Well, if you read a lot of the Zen books that are out there, a lot of the 
whether it be the three pillars of Zen or Zen, the authentic gate, a lot of the big unlocks that happen with meditation are not just through 50 minutes a day, which mm-hmm. Zen is typically 25 minutes of seated meditation, five minutes of walking, and then another 25 minutes of seated. It actually happens at these sessions, so these like proper retreats, you know, mm-hmm. where you're doing days meditating and, and you really go deep. It allows your mind to really calm. And you've done this. You've been yep. there. So I, I just I just want to go. I want to see what's there. Like in this spirit of unlocking these other doors and trying new things, like, hell yeah. Like let's let's go. Let's go. You know? <laughs> LFG. Zen. <laughs> <laughs> uh all right. Are you concerned at all? Do you have any worries? How are your knees gonna be? You're going to be sitting a lot. I'm huh? going to be bringing my seated, I use a kind of Japanese style seated bench for, for meditation versus the folded legs. It's kind of like a Sibian. It's got a little like a bidet. adapter on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm going to go and do that. Tachi magic wand. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Keeps I'm, the hips loose. Yeah, exactly. I don't even know what you're saying, but that sounds great. <laughs> I'm used to sitting for an hour a day like that. So that's, that's not a, I, I don't, no, but don't you're going to be going from oh, I know. an hour to how many hours a day? I'm fine. Like, like it's going to be wow. like eight or once you, eight or once you lose feeling in your legs, you're fine. I'm fine. I, 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 I'm really like, I'm just all roll in. back to your room. <laughs> yeah. I'm all in. I, I just want to do this. Good for very, you. very for excited. You, yeah. I, I do like Henry. Henry's amazing. Yeah. Uh, for, for those of you who don't know, just a plug for Henry through via Sam. Henry has a lot of his courses on the waking up app from Sam Harris. So you can, you can check his stuff out there. Fantastic Zen teacher. Just a, a good human, you know? Yeah, yeah, great guy. Very well spoken. You've had him on the guy. podcast twice. He's been on twice. So for people who want a taste test of Dr. Shookman, you can... your, your second interview with him around the coins was just brilliant, dude. It oh, was it was so fun. good. It was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that was part of the intention for the first episode, as you know. Yeah. And then we got hooked on all these other topics and didn't come back to it. And I was like, all right, we need to They're go around so to cool. Him. Yeah, I love yeah. it. So anything you've enjoyed watching recently? Yes. I was going to get into some of the, I figure we could do, because it's been a while since we've hung out and I'm sure, you know, with COVID and everything else, we've yeah. hit some good movies. Yeah. I was going to give you like my favorite porn bullet, search terms, five bullet movie <laughs> list. <laughs> Cause I know you love five bullets. I, I actually do. have I, five bullets right here. Oh my God, you, do. Bullets. All right. <laughs> you love those bullets. Uh, I do. How about my five bullet movie list? And then you tell me yes or no, whether you like these, whether you've seen them. Oh, great. Yeah. And then you do the same for me. You got five. I do not have five. I have one. All right. But <laughs> good, 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 good job. <laughs> <laughs> but it has six episodes. So technic- okay. technically, I think I have six and you okay, have five. Sweet. Okay. So. <laughs> six more Friday. Cool. All right. So the new Top Gun. Fucking great. Fantastic. Can you believe that he did all that flying it's himself? Unbelievable. I mean, the, the, the fact that he is still doing so many of his own stunts is it's insane incredible and it's it's got it makes you want to pick up scientology <laughs> <laughs> you know you're in the right place yeah exactly <laughs> yeah, it's true. The, the real reason that kevin moved to yeah, la that is not <laughs> the case <laughs> i i thought maverick was fantastic saw so it in good. imax i hadn't seen anything on imax in a long time and i was like all right look if we're gonna do it Let's actually do it. I really went into it being like, oh, Jesus, I hope they don't ruin this. You know, yeah, like yeah. another Top Gun. Is this going to be yeah. cheesy? And I walked away being like, damn, that was good. It oh, was, it was really good. It was fantastic. And uh, I mean, it's, there have been also a lot of filmmakers who have enjoyed it. Not that that's my indicator. I just thought it'd be fun to go see uh, old school, all the tropes. Yeah. Like use all the cliches because they oh, work. The music. Yeah. Dun, 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 yeah, dun, dun, absolutely. Dun, dun. So good. Just, you know exactly what you're signing up for. Yeah. And it's like having something that reliable and uplifting is like really reassuring in a world of increasingly chaotic uncertainty. It's like, yeah, you know, when you go to see fucking Maverick, it's not going to end with like an orphan kid dying. Right. You know that that's not the ending. <laughs> all right. So the next, the next movie, the the price of everything have you seen that the price of everything is this an art doc yes yes That's i saw good. it a long time yeah i saw it quite a few years ago yeah i really really enjoyed it okay, so why cool. don't you you've seen it much more recently though yeah i mean it's, it basically just gives you if you're ever curious uh kind of behind the scenes of the contemporary art world what goes on at auction how these artists make their art they actually which is crazy they actually hire like people to do the art for some them. of them do. Yeah. Some of them do. 
it's just a crazy behind the scenes view of the art world. And for someone that's into NFTs, it was just like, I learned a lot. So I highly recommend it. It is a wild romp through contemporary art. And if you're in the camp of, let's just say, advocate, right? You really enjoy contemporary art, you'll get a lot out of it. And also, if, if you think that much of contemporary art is complete horseshit, you will also get a lot out of it because yeah. neither camp is going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, love, can I have a little sippers of something you find? Thank you. Uh, not a beer, just like any wine or anything. Thank you. So the price of the next one, Elvis, I the new not. Elvis film. Oh, look at that. There we go. Bam. Thank you. Look at that bling. <laughs> so the new Elvis film. So here's the deal. I don't, I don't care about Elvis. Who cares about Elvis? Right? Like I, I didn't think, <laughs> okay. no, seriously. I, yeah, I yeah. was like Elvis, old people, blah, blah, blah. You watch Elvis, this, this new movie. So why did you go to it? Um, Tony Conrad actually told me it was fantastic. Uh, all right. And so I put it on and I was blown away huh. because Elvis was a misfit. Like he grew up in a black neighborhood. That's yeah. what, how he got a lot of that kind of soul vibe like that came through in his music. Yeah. And then also he was like thrown in jail because of the way he moved his hips and shit. <laughs> like that, these were the times back then. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so like he got on stage when like, just like make his finger move and stuff to like, like get the crowd going and shit. <laughs> Cause he couldn't move his hips. Otherwise he'd be thrown in jail. It's a brilliant story. Then it shows how he got hooked on drugs. Mm. And whenever I thought of Elvis, I thought of this like kind of Vegas singer overweight, passed away. Oh, I don't know much, but yeah. I learned a lot. And he reminds me of just any other icon. I, I can see why he's so massive. I, I, it was like a history lesson in a movie. So highly recommend cool. it. Yeah. yeah. I'll check it out. I'll you should. It, out. it looked like the cinematography was beautiful just he, based on the preview. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I was not expecting to love an Elvis movie. That is not me. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I, I walked away being like, he was a badass, a lot cooler cool. than I thought. I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, next one, everything, everywhere, all at once. Yes. So good. It was great. And I'll, I'll give you a bit of trivia. Maybe if you have not heard this already, I was watching it and Michelle Yeoh's husband from within 30 seconds, I was like, I know that guy. Goonies. Yes, exactly. I was like data from the Goonies within like 30 seconds. I'm just so glad that that guy Got working. still around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he could have ended up in a million different places. And the fact that he's in, he, he, I'm sure he's maybe he been, good in, too. He's been in maybe many, many, many other films. But to end up in this as such a, I don't want to say sleeper hit, but like unexpected, I would it imagine, mega of, hit. So I, I made Daria watch it. And, and she was just like, what the hell am I watching? <laughs> it's a weird ass film. It's a super bizarre movie. If you like really weird shit and you're just like, your jam is kind of like funky, indie, odd. Like it, it, you walk away being like, what the hell did I just watch? But it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant at the end of the day. Oh yeah. I really the, enjoyed the it. The jumping for the dildo scene <laughs> was just, you remember that when they're trying <laughs> to race? Do. Oh yes. No, yeah, I the, do. Yeah. Yes. The in a fight scene. Yeah. It's in the middle exactly, of a fight scene. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot to it. It's a strange movie. So my last one on list of ones that I've watched recently, that was for here's number five airplane, the original airplane. Oh, <laughs> have you watched that recently? <laughs> no. And it would never get made today, which is probably no, part of wouldn't. what makes it funny. It's cringe, like bad, like really <laughs> sexist. And there's a whole, a whole lot of jokes in there that you look at and you're like, how the hell do they make this? But it's also like there's so many iconic moments and, and, and bits that when you watch it, <laughs> I heard you spitting in the back of the class there. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's fantastic to watch again. Airplane. Yeah. Oldie. I'm into it. All right. What's your one movie that you have to recommend? Well, I'll share an oldie. It's not as old as airplane, but if people have not seen, I recently rewatched it spirited away mm. by studio Ghibli, which at the time was headed up by a, Miyazaki Hayao, my favorite movie of all time. Still really? Is. Why? Yeah. It just I has, watch it and I'm like, this is good, you know? It just has all the ingredients. I think I also watched it when I was 15 or 16. Mm. So there's it, a it might, nostalgia. It might, have been, it might have been a few years later, but the coming of age and hero's journey of Chihiro, who then gets renamed Sen, and there's a whole story and sequence behind that, the fact 
that she goes from so weak to so self-confident and strong, the way that is woven in to a fantasy backdrop, including so many of my favorite things, right? I mean, there's like Japanese bathhouse, a bunch of weird gods, you know, a bunch of creepy like ghost type phantasms, yeah. like Kaonashi or, or No Face is one of the characters. And I thought the animation and the backgrounds and everything, when you consider particularly that they're hand painted, was spectacular and is spectacular. So I've rewatched that. I'm also very interested now in world building. I'm doing a bunch of fiction writing right now. Mm, can you tell us more about that. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. And uh, are you going to talk about that today or no? Uh, no, I'll save it. I'll save it. Okay. But I, I will say. I'm bouncing around a little bit. So Spirited Away, and then recently read a classic, I think it was published in 1968 initially, called The Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin. And it's incredible. It's such a beautifully crafted book. The language is really not flowery, but poetic, sometimes in a very simplistic way. That is to say even very basic sentences, she'll make beautiful. And without the Wizard of Earthsea, Harry Potter doesn't exist. Mm. Or at least wizarding schools, as we've come to think about them. There are so many components of fantasy worlds that we take for granted now that would not have existed were it for the Wizard of Earthsea. And then prior to that, I also listened to, um, I know I'm jumping around a bit, the Fellowship of the Ring for the first time. So I had not mm. read Lord of the Rings. I had not read any J.R.R. Tolkien. And when you consume <laughs> when you consume those two books, especially Tolkien stuff, you realize how many of the archetypes that we just assume have been around forever because they're so ubiquitous yeah. came out of this guy's head. One question there. Did you see the new Amazon series? The new Amazon series. The oh, new Lord the, of the Rings. Uh, I can't remember the the name of it. I've seen the trailer pop up because they're yeah. promoting the hell out of it. Oh, they I, spent a billion dollars on the series. It's okay. crazy. Yeah, Jim I haven't Bezos watched. Went nuts. I haven't watched it, but I will. Cool. And as far as my other item, my one item, <laughs> I'll mention it. I mentioned it <laughs> to Daria earlier because I think it's so spectacular. It's a limited series or a six part, I want to say, animated series, although it, it combines 3D and 2D animation in a really innovative, spectacular way, is Arcane, which you heard me mention mm -hmm. earlier as well. And Arcane is based on a game I have never played, but many people do, League of Legends, or it's based on some yeah. characters from this game. And Riot Games and... There's a, a separate behind-the-scenes series, which is the making of Arcane, called Bridging the Rift, which I'm also watching. And they just threw everything at this. And the animation studio in France, Fortiche, that helped to create the uh, not just the visual components, there's a lot to it, and the musical is this streaming? composition behind it, it is on Netflix. Oh, cool. And every, every frame of this series could be a beautiful, large NFT or a piece of artwork that you would put on a wall. I love that. I mean, it is staggeringly detailed hmm. and gorgeous. So I, I'm just recommending it to everybody. I right. think, and they spent nine figures on it. I don't know if it was 100 million, 200 or more, but the fact that they were willing to dedicate, after a lot of testing, it wasn't haphazard, but willing to dedicate that type of resources wow. to a six-part animated series. Oh, man. It's, awesome. It's, it's really gorgeous. And it also shows a contemporary example of world building. Even though there is world building, there is world building in League of Legends, because I've learned more about the game, even though I haven't played it. When you're creating six hours of content on a handful of characters. You have to flesh them out sure. and create narrative arcs that intertwine in a way that you just don't necessarily have to in a video game. So highest recommendation. Can I pick your brain a little bit here or just maybe get you to divulge a little bit here? <laughs> you've talked, you've mentioned now a couple of times about doing a little bit of writing in this genre. You're not doing a book. No. But you're doing something 
I mean, I think now's the time to start kind of teasing things out a little bit. Can you just tell us what what is Tim working on these days? Like, and you don't have to go into a lot of detail, <laughs> but can you can you give us a little bit of like I'm I'm fleshing out doing this or maybe pushing here? Or can you? Well, I, here's what I'll say. I'll say that yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hey toasty. I'm not gonna divulge too much, but I will say that I've been experimenting with fiction for about. A year and a half, two years. Well, you did the NFT with, with well, us, which is great to bring it up. So yeah. my first NFT experiment, thanks to your encouragement, was a short fiction piece called uh, If You Want to Start a War. And I really enjoyed the process of putting that together. And specifically the writing process of playing with fiction. And in that particular case, it was very strongly based on real events. It's fiction, but a lot of it was based on real people and real events, which makes it even spookier if people want to check that out. Uh, and we did that through Grails, mm-hmm. which was great. And I'm continuing to work those muscles after a lot of conversations with people like Stephen Pressfield and others who, who have been very encouraging. I may have some stuff to show in the next few months. Cool. Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll put it. I'll put it that way. But it has been a great excuse to read and watch a lot of fiction, sci-fi and and fantasy primarily, and have learned so much. I've ended up going really deep. So with Ursula K. Le Guin, for instance, who was a huge influence on Neil Gaiman, whose writing I've loved for a very long time, including books that I've recommended probably on previous random shows many years ago, Mm -hmm. like The Graveyard Book, which is just fantastic. If people only read nonfiction and you want an easy gateway drug, try that out. The audiobook by Neil Gaiman is fantastic. In any case, so I'm, I'm working as I'm thinking about fiction through these influences and lineages, right? So I'm looking at Neil Gaiman, like all sorts of aspects of his process in writing. And then I hear him talking about Ursula K. Le Guin. Then I go on Twitter and ask people if I'm only going to read one of her books, which one should I read? Get a whole host of answers. Start with The Wizard of Earthsea. That leads me somewhere else. Then I watch a PBS documentary on her life and then learn about A, B, and C. And just following the breadcrumbs yeah. of my curiosity in that way has has... So Tim, I've seen you like, a while. I've seen you like this of a handful of times. Yeah, I've seen you write a handful of books. Now we've been friends that long. Yeah, and I see when you go down rabbit holes, and I I, I see this, I see this, <laughs> and I, I can recognize it, and it means yeah, that yeah. you're up to something big. <laughs> I'm just, I, yeah, I it mean, really uh, does. It yeah. means, and, and you look happy when you're yeah, describing this. Time. It looks like you're having a good time. I'm having a good time. That makes me happy. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, I'm ex- I'm excited, and it's, I feel like I'm. Uh, I am a, awakening muscles or sort of creative processes that processes that have been dormant for a long time. It, it feels like this is um, it, it's potentially a new way for you to flex your creativity in a, in a different yeah. And something that you've been it's it sounds like this is something you've had a passion for for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And now is the first time you're like, okay, I'm going to go for it here. And, yeah, totally. And it, it it brings back so many and there's a value here right it's not just simple nostalgia there it brings back so many emotional imprints that were powerful and positive when i was a kid and especially given some of the darker stuff that i've talked about in my childhood it's easy for my psyche to weigh the negative more heavily right to weigh the dark stuff more heavily but by say going then into some of these these corners of the fiction world, it's brought me back to, for instance, uh, right now I'm rereading The Neverending Story by Michael Enda. Mm-hmm. I mean, which was my favorite book as a kid. And I remember I used to get in trouble. I would pull pranks and stuff and get sent to detention. <laughs> and detention in elementary school was in a few places. I always tried to dodge the nurse's office because it's so boring. I wanted to get sent to the library. And then I would go get sent to the library and I, I started reading The NeverEnding Story and I fell so in love with it that I took it out of its spot 
and I hid it in a different corner of the library so that nobody else would take it out so I wouldn't get interrupted. And then I would get into detention again and I would know exactly where it was hidden so I could go back and continue awesome. reading an Evering story. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Uh, maybe you, you could, some people might have this experience if, for instance, they saw Aladdin as a kid and then they go and watch it as an adult and they're like, oh my God, Robin Williams had a lot of humor for adults. Mm-hmm. And I didn't notice it as a kid. Mm-hmm. Similarly, with a lot of these fiction books, like you read The Wizard of Earthsea or you read The Neverending Story, there is a lot of deep philosophical discussion and a lot of insight and you might even say truth that is really applicable, maybe even more so to adults who can grok that piece of it. Don't you love that when you reread something a little bit later yeah. and, and it just hits you in a completely different way? Yeah, totally. It's the best. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. So I'm lit up. Yeah, I feel good. That's awesome. Love to hear that. Sweet. Should we, I've got a couple, I know we're coming up on an hour here, but I've got a couple more quick little things that are fun. Coming up on an hour? How old are we? Jesus. (laughs) It's like, it's it's time to go to bed. It's nine, it's nine 45. It's nine 45. Time to have my warm milk and go to bed. (laughs) Put on my overalls. (laughs) Do I have a little more shampoo's love? Thank you. Tim needs a little splash or something too. Uh, (laughs) Carbonated water is great for me. (laughs) So this is a fun one, actually. This is completely off topic, but I thought it was just, it's such a fun little hack. I love how this is off topic for the random show. (laughs) Yeah, it's going to be worth Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So one of the things that I love about the random show is we can bring up anything. And it's just like, it's like, what are we excited about? What little hacks are we finding? And we used to do a lot of that back in the day. (laughs) Now that we're old, now we're just old and lazy. Yeah, we're like tired. We were, we were joking. Hacks, who has time for that? We were uh, we were joking about this before we went live. We we're going to talk about like what cholesterol medicine we're on and shit. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was just saying the twenty year old versions of us would be so disappointed. So disappointed. <laughs> um, so inflation is 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 a, is a bitch right now, right? It's, yep. it's kind of going crazy. One of the things that. It's like $34 avocado toast here in Santa yeah, Monica. It's, it's not cheap. People are hurting. We got to go tomorrow, by the way. I know a great place. <laughs> okay. to take you to. So one of the things that I've always generally avoided are just bonds, government bonds, and in, 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 because the interest rates have been shit, right? Yeah. So they have this, something called the I-bonds. And so I-bonds- I, letter I. Yeah, letter I. And so I bonds, um, dumb, dumb question. Yeah. I bonds. Yeah, exactly. EYE. Not the EYE. <laughs> so the letter I bonds, um, you can buy directly on treasury direct.gov, which is the government website. And I've done this over the last couple of years and it, it's really, it's great. They max out at 10 K. So the most you can put in is 10 grand and you can do it for you. Your spouse can have one. And then also you can do it for your kids as well. And right now, the I bond is based on the, the current inflation plus interest on top of that. So you get 9.62% from the government. Hmm. Like that's good. Right. And, yeah. and granted that can change with inflation and all of that, but like I'll lock in that rate any day. Like I'll go yeah. for that for sure. So, you know, I, you can, if you have a hundred dollars, you can do it. This, this yeah. is applicable to pretty much everyone. Right. Hmm. So not, not investment advice, but no, it's totally it, investment it, advice. But if you use code KevKev, <laughs> yeah, exactly. With well, the government website, use code uh, KRO and identify as child of. No, it's just it's it's one of those things where it's like, dude, when you talk about kind of a good year in the stock market, you're talking, you know, ten percent is what you're kind of hoping for on average. Yeah, for sure. And and that's with a lot of risk, right? And the fact that you can get a U.S. government bond. And it's going to yield you nine point six two right now. Like that's that's just like free money. So, <laughs> well, I mean, it, 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 listen. If the government defaults on their bonds, yes, come after me. But well, like, I mean, like, like, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll have and, and we'll have marauder trucks on the roads. <laughs> <laughs> By that point, it'll be hard to find Kevin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, I thought it was worth yeah. bringing up. You oh, know, for sure. I've never. I, 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 clearly, if I'm asking if it's I bond with an EYE, I've never heard of it either. So, <laughs> right there with you, folks. Uh, I got I got two today for my kids, and I'm just gonna like put that as car money for the future. Yeah, just let it go, and then when it expires, I'll go and reinvest it. And yeah, it's it's good. Cool. I bond. I bonds with an I. Little hack. So I got a couple. I, I I'm not sure this is count as a hack, but I'll just I'll lump it in. 
or include it because it relates to thematically the stuff that's going on in my mind. And that is, I watched a masterclass. So company's masterclass, they have all these various instructionals with people in every discipline you can imagine, including a number that I've already mentioned, like Neil Gaiman. And they had one with Amy Tan, who's a very famous novelist. And the first few segments in particular, I found incredibly compelling. And she's so eloquent also. She's, <laughs> she seems to speak in finished prose, and I only know a few people like that. And it always just blows my mind that they're able to do that. Sam Harris would be another one. Oh, and waking up at, remember, <laughs> side note, I don't think Sam would mind me asking. At one point, I was listening to his many meditations, and I listened to one, and I texted him and I said, Sam, is there any chance I could get the text for like the X, Y, and Z episode? And he's like, what do you mean the text? And I'm like, the script that you used for recording the A, B, and C part of that episode. And he goes, oh, I don't, I don't use scripts. <laughs> I was like, and I was like, oh, yeah, you and I are just different <laughs> animals, <laughs> different species entirely. So the that's a- impressive. He just wings it because it's oh, good. It's man. good content. I mean, he is. Yeah, he just has different hardware, uh, and it's a, it's not just a. It's not born that way. I recognize it's also a, a skill that he's developed. But Amy Tan, similar. Very, very well spoken and extremely good at explaining how she approaches different facets of fiction and how she has pulled from her own life. She also has an entire segment where she goes through all of the rejection letters or at least some of the some of the most notable of the rejection letters that she got in the beginning. Just rejection after rejection after rejection. What was cool that you don't see, at least I didn't see when I got a lot of my rejections, is fiction editors in a number of cases gave her great feedback on her manuscript. So they read the whole thing and then they were like, this is, this is what you could do to improve this part. And here are three other things you could do to really strengthen this aspect of it. You just, at least in my experience, don't get that from rejections and nonfiction. So it was, it was cool to see hmm. not just how she thought about responding to criticism. She was actually really grateful for a lot of the letters, but also how much she gained from the feedback and then hmm. used to iterate her fiction, which is just fantastic. Do you do the monthly on that masterclass or do you do the yearly? I did neither. In this particular case, I got a, a freebie a freebie on like Delta Airlines or United or somewhere. Oh, I just yeah. keep getting billed for that shit. It drives me nuts. <laughs> I always think I'm going to like watch a bunch of them, you know, and I sign I mean, up for I'm it. still paying for match.com and because I could not figure out how to cancel a thing. <laughs> and it's like, I haven't used match in like 20 years. So you're welcome. Match.com. Yeah. <laughs> I still get fucked on some things. episodes. There's like two or three things I just can't figure out how to cancel. <laughs> like seriously. And and you know what's funny is they I figured it out. They only bill you close to midnight. Yeah. Because they know the push notifications come through. The other night I was up late and it was like eleven thirty and I had one of those pop down and it was oh, the yearly clever. thing. Yeah. Clever. And I'm like, you fucker. And then I went to bed and I just forgot. I don't even know who it is. I forgot. But they, they got me. Sucks. <laughs> oh, you know, hey, that's what growth hacking's for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So, physical training. I've been thinking a lot about physical training. I have. A, You've got a gut now, dude. I have a little bit of a gut. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, I mean, look as look as tall shit. You're, you're as fat as I am. You're like fat, you're definitely as fat I'm as not, I am. I'm not. Are you kidding me? No, you're like Pull fat. Your you're gut. like you're like fat bastard see. from. Let me see. Austin Powers. Let me see it. Let me see. Okay, I'm definitely skinnier than you, dude. What are you talking? You won't even. Oh no, no. Let me no. feel that. Okay, you're a little skinnier. <laughs> <laughs> not I mean, much, look, I'm not so. proud not of much. it. I am not proud, uh, and I'm not going to blame it on age. Although I guess <laughs> I will say things are slowing down. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I have actually lost a decent amount of this baby fat using a couple baby, of not baby fat anymore. <laughs> it's geriatric fat yeah. uh, with a few simple things. One is a sled. So I have something called the XPO trainer that is a mechanically assisted or I should say mechanically resisted sled. So you don't have to load it with plates and it's on inflatable. I think they're inflatable. One may be solid rubber tires so you can use them on say a driveway. And 
I've been using the XPO trainer plus some jump rope, which is very minimal. Like, jump rope is hard. Dude. Is, yeah, I'll, I I do that for like five or ten minutes. It's, Doesn't it, it kill do- you? I did jump rope recently. I was like dead afterwards. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the point in the beginning. So yeah, I know, but like, I, I thought it was going to be like some schoolyard <laughs> shit. That's just difficult. Oh no, it's hard. It's hard. So I'll do, the, I'll do the jump rope, then the XPO trainer and then kettlebells. And I have some alternation, but most mornings I will do some combination of those things. And I've been doing, I mean, it's pretty easy for me to do intermittent fasting. So I'm just doing late lunch, early dinner mm. typically. Can we get one of those croissants in the morning I was telling you about? <laughs> I mean, look, man, I haven't seen you in what, like 27 years. So, You're on vacation. Yeah. I mean, if I use travel as vacation equals <laughs> I can eat butter cookies anytime I want, I'm going to turn, I will turn into Fat Bastard from Austin Powers, which is not the look I'm going for, especially like, imagine bald Fat Bastard. That's not good. No, you don't want that. No. All right. What else you got here? Um, yeah. So, I think the last thing for me was that uh, I did one of these full body scans. What? Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, Daria is telling me it is true. I do. <laughs> I do super. No, we're not cutting a video of me doing supernatural. <laughs> I do a VR workout called Supernatural three times a week. Have you tried this? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh my god, we have to get Tim to do it right after this, right? <laughs> yes, you're gonna freak out, dude. <laughs> Okay. It's really good. I hate VR. It's stupid. <laughs> this yeah, is you, amazing. Yeah, well, I, I love that you've been like short VR for like the last 10 years. And I've made w- good w- money being w- short w- VR. W- but you, you now own a VR device. Yeah. Well, I've had a VR device. You have to play with all the latest shit if you're a technologist. Yeah. All right. I'm just saying that like it's dumb except for this app. This app's amazing. <laughs> so Supernatural is, a, is it's a, like a, you have two lightsabers. Okay. And you have to slice shit in the air. And it sounds like it's not Fruit Ninja. It's like way better than that. <laughs> it's done to music. It's choreographed to music. It's amazing. <laughs> okay. Tim, you're going to love it. Sounds amazing. I mean, like lightsabers, chopping things. Yeah. You choreographed to music. I mean, that's three for three for me. <laughs> <Exactly. so. laughs> anyway, Supernatural is how I get my, um, my hit in every almost like every other day pretty much <laughs> so so more more slicing and less jump rope yeah it's, you'll it's, like it we'll try <laughs> more, more croissants we're gonna try it afterwards <laughs> um so that's my big thing the other thing i was gonna say is i did one of those full body mri scans called oh Pernovo. yeah yeah, yeah we should talk about this this is something i need to get on yeah so yeah, yeah I, you know what honestly it was like i don't know if it was my mom getting cancer i think i did it before that but like I was just one of those things where I got to the stage in life where I had a couple little girls and I'm like, you know, I, Tia was telling me, he was mm-hmm. like, Hey, you know, you can do these. You're at the age now where it makes sense. See if anything shows up. They can detect like it, it's, it's, it's something like 80% of cancers at stage one, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, let's do it. So I went and did it two years ago, came back you know, all the standard stuff like, oh, we see this here, but you know, that's normal, blah, blah, blah. Like this is a little bit weird. You have an extra vertebrae, which I actually do, which is weird. Um, so oh, oh, a little vestigial tail. Yeah, exactly. A bunch of shit hey, like ladies. that. ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I do that. And then I go for year two and I go and get the scan again. And they call me up and they're, they're like, yeah, it turns out you have a little brain aneurysm, a little, a little small brain aneurysm. And oh, I'm like, man. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, this is crazy. Okay. Tell me more. And then after the fact, like a month later or not a month later, but a few weeks later, my doctor calls them and says, Hey, what, what, what do we see on the first scan? They found it on the first scan as well. It hadn't changed, which is great. Yeah. And it's super tiny. It's the smallest. My doctor said, if they hadn't been using the latest tech, they wouldn't even have detected it at all because yeah. it was so small. So it's only one millimeter and they don't treat them till they get to seven millimeters. Yeah. So it's like, it's totally fine. You want to keep your blood pressure low and all that. But it's also, it's weird because in some sense, like you want to detect those stage one cancers, but there's a lot of false positives. Not that this yeah. is a false positive. It's something to pay attention to. Certainly changing my dietary actions in terms of keeping sodium low and like lowering my blood pressure. Yeah. But it's something you should do. Yeah. Which is why we're having croissants and coffee tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not going to mess with my blood pressure. I'm just fucking with you. But, you know, it's, it's so, like... I mean, was that... I would imagine that to be terrifying. I mean, I, yeah. It's 45 minutes, so it's fast. And they, not the procedure. The review of the results. Yeah. I mean, you go through it, and I have a couple spots in my brain, and they, they told me you're allowed one per decade. 
And so like, you're fine. You have, you know, two or three or whatever. That's fine. I'm like, okay, this still doesn't sound good. Like, <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. It's like a bruised apple, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah. And then they're like, they're like your lymph nodes. This is the first scan. They're like, your lymph nodes are really swollen on the left side. I'm like, cool. Like, what does that mean? And they're, they're like, did you get your, your COVID vaccine on that side? I'm like, yeah, I did. And they're like, okay, that's why. Mm-hmm. And then that would turn out to be fine. And then, you know, they found like some other shit like there's a little bit of like a a little well, a little tail no there's like a, a little like like i have this little tiny bulge in my right nut sack that it's it just it's kind of like the the little stringy thing that connects to the sack kind of bulged out a little bit and they're like that's totally normal it's yeah. not cancer you're fine blah blah so like you know it's just like a little shit like that where you're just like cool oh my god i can't wait until our random shows when we're like in our 60s and 70s yeah. it's just gonna be a my litany prostate. of injuries and <laughs> exactly. prostate complaints exactly. oh my god so I still let me just it. rewind so wait, wait, I make wait. sure no just make sure I'm hearing you correctly so were you pissed that they did not if Tell it had changed time. yeah that they didn't spot it you first know, time around I think it was it was so small that they just they have different it's not a radiologist whoever it is that reviews it it's probably a radiologist is it, I think it is I think the first part was, was like this is so insignificant I don't even need to call it out and the second one called it out yeah they were just like and then they compared the notes and it was fine this is the story I haven't told. A friend of mine went in, had a scan. They found a growth in his brain, non-cancerous, a decent size, operated, removed it. He's fine, but he didn't even know he had it. And he was just yeah. going in for, for a thing and it was growing yeah. and, and it saved his life most likely. Yeah. That's, that's wild. And so it's shit like that. And the, and the, the radiologist, when I talked to him, he said the number, he goes, I don't really drink. He goes, but the number of bottles of wine I get in the mail from people that are like, you saved my life because you found this at stage one or stage yeah. two. I don't know. It's just one of those things where. Get your diagnostics, folks. And I mean, do it more. I hesitate to say this, but like, don't, don't push out the interval. If you're supposed to get something every five years, if anything, get it more frequently. Don't push it out. I had, so I have recently had the opposite experience with a friend of mine who went in for a routine exam, stage four cancer terminal. Holy shit. And I just uh, spent several days with him and uh, not type because, of cancer, not because I don't want to give specifics just in case people like triangulate yeah. stuff, but it's metastasized. And at this point, surgery, at least some types of surgery don't make any sense. And man, if you want a proof point for what someone can do with decades of meditation practice. He is incredibly upbeat. He's super happy. He is as productive as he can be. He's spending a lot of time with loved ones, of course, but he is consciously choosing of all the decision trees a path of gratitude and not naive optimism, but optimism is in the sense of looking at everything as mm. the glass half full. And I was so inspired by this because I'm going through some hard stuff myself. And to see someone in those circumstances able to demonstrate that it just blew my mind. Yeah. And I've spent, I know him well enough and we've had enough interactions. I, I know it is not an act. It is not oh. an act. And I'm really impressed because that's not automatically the case. I mean, there are people, including famous, famous meditators who are world famous teachers who on their deathbeds or in the process of going through hospice, just say over and over again to their closest friends, like, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And they're afraid, which is understandable. I might be that person. I mean, certainly I have no confidence that I would end up responding the way my friend is responding, but it's been incredibly inspiring. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's certainly sad in its own way, but a real gift that he's also giving those around him. It's incredible. How are you doing with the dealing with all that? Uh, you mean with, with his situation? Be hard being a friend, having a friend go through something like that, you know? 
Uh, Are you going to see him again? Do you think before he passes, or is it something? I would that's like, like to. I would like to. I mean, it's. I. I don't know how long the time horizon is. It's. It's. Uh, it may not be that long. I am doing well with it because of how he is able to choose to respond to this unfolding story. Of course, it's sad on a number of levels, right? But I mean, we're all, we all have a one way ticket as far as we know. Yeah. You know, my, my dad, before he passed said, there's no lease on life. He just like wanted to remind me of that. Like, yeah. it's like, you know, it's coming for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and it's not something you want to think about all the time, right? but if you think about it, none of the time you also have a problem. And this, this has been a very strong reminder for me. It was like, yeah, get it together. You know, like when I had, um, don't dick around too much, like have fun. Don't take everything seriously, but also realize that like every moment you have like this, not to get all cheesy, but it's like, these are precious, amazing moments. Yeah. Everybody's healthy. Yeah. I think about that with my girls every day, yeah. dude, the kids. You know, um, I had Sam Harris on the podcast a while ago, a couple of years ago, and we talked about the Buddhist monk that was sitting in a meditative pose on the cover of Rage Against the Machine that yeah. had doused himself in gasoline in defiance of the local government and lit himself on fire and did not flinch. And this has been recorded. Yeah. And there was pictures and everything else. Video. Did not, Video did not, too. Did yeah. not move. Yeah. Holy shit. You want to talk about meditation really working? Like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> I, I could barely shit. stay in a cold plunge this morning for three <laughs> <Yeah>. minutes. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I was in the sauna today. I was like, oh, 15 minutes. I'm going to make it 20. Okay, we're going to go for it. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. It, I mean, it's, uh, you know, all of these things are kind of pointing at by all these things, I guess I'm bookending some of our earlier discussion that touched on psychedelics. And I mentioned psychiatry and these sort of tectonic plate shifts that I think are, are currently underway, but will be most noticeable five, 10 years from now. And the types of feats that we're describing all point to severe, I think, underappreciation for what we are capable of in terms of yes. shaping mind and consciousness. Yeah. Right. Because lighting yourself on fire and not flinching should not be possible. No. <laughs> like, I'm not, yeah. Clearly not even David Blaine. Like no one, no, yeah. yeah. No one wants to end up having to test that. Right. But there are a lot of outcomes that we're seeing, say in treating various, diagnoses related to, I don't want to say mental illness, but psychiatric conditions that are considered intractable or extremely difficult to treat. And some of the outcomes that we're seeing, which are not solely produced through psychedelics. I don't want to make psychedelics sound like a panacea of any type. They're not. They have, in some cases, very significant risks. But it's it's clear that many of the paradigms through which we've treated patients specifically with any type of what we would consider mental illness is is likely resting on a number of assumptions that are completely untrue. Yeah. And that's exciting. It's really yeah. exciting. I remember our friend Dr. Weil 20 years ago was speaking about chemotherapy and said how barbaric it will look in the future. And it turns mm. out that is actually true. We have immunotherapy now. My mom's going through it. Like there's a lot of these things that are very, very promising. And we're just like a few years away from some really exciting breakthroughs. I'm not sure if you saw that, that New York times article about the, uh, it was like eight out of eight patients cured with this new type of immunotherapy and cancer. No. Did you see that? It was a Mm-mm. groundbreaking, crazy study uh, about this new type of immunotherapy. That's just now coming out here soon. But I'd imagine the same is true for psychedelics, right? Like, you know, 20 years from now, they'll have honed it in yeah. and figured out the right dose, the right, I mean, they may even modify those molecules. Like who knows where it's going to go, but it's going to be exciting. It, it is going to be exciting. I, I think the, 
you know, we're all driven by our beliefs, right? These thoughts we take to be true and assumptions, even scientists are subject to this, right? I mean, scientists are not robots. And so you have anyone doing anything comes in with a certain set of, of, uh, biases or biases. And in psychedelics, you see also in the, in the psychedelic for-profit sector, you see a lot of motivated reasoning where you, you have a number of split camps and different kind of schisms within these communities. And one of them is between Camp A. And Camp A believes that many of the clinical outcomes for depression and PTSD and so on are driven by the content of an experience and the narrative that you can restructure uh, after you observe it for the first time, perhaps, right? The software that's, that's behind many of your decisions, blah, 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 blah. They think it's the content. In which case, if that is your belief, and in an ideal world, you would be able to test these things definitively, and many people are making attempts at this, but it's, it's really challenging then you want enough workspace to allow all that to play out. So let's just say psilocybin and having a session of four to six hours would be viewed as a feature and not a bug. Then you have camp B, which is saying, oh yeah, all those hallucinations, terrible side effects. Really what's happening is on this structural level and this type of XYZ is happening to this receptor and da, 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 da. And we can do all of that if we change the molecule without the psychedelic effects and also press it into like a 30 minute session and that will copy and paste into our current medical formatting mm. much more easily. But there's a profit motive there, right? Because if you can, if you can scale something in that way and reduce some of the quote unquote side effects and also patent it. Yeah. And absolutely patent it. And then also make it a drug that you need to take at least twice a week or maybe even every day instead of once a month or once every three months that there are necessarily a bad thing though. It's not automatically a bad thing, but I just think it's important for folks to be aware of incentives and to track incentives. Right. So, because then it just turns into another, a better antidepressant, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It depends on how the antidepressant is achieving its effects. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are immediate, there are immediate changes that can be beneficial in a whole host of different situations with medicine, generally speaking, right? So with the pharmacological intervention, it's like if you're if you're bleeding out and you need a coagulant, like you don't want the <laughs> you don't have to wait a long time for that to work. And similarly, it's like if you are suffering from suicidal ideation and are at risk of harming or killing yourself, you need something that's going to work really quickly. In which case just putting this out there as like intravenous ketamine yeah. treatment may be it's the number one thing, right? Maybe a, may be something you consider. It's not going to fix all of your problems, but it's going to stop the immediate bleeding. So to speak, isn't that right? what they do? If someone comes in and they're about to commit suicide, don't they give them IV ketamine? Like I've heard that's a thing. I don't know what it looks like. Actually, I'd love to hear from people in the audience who, who know how something like that is triaged in an ER. Right? If yeah. somebody shows up and maybe a loved one brought them and they're like, I'm going to blow my head off. Uh, I would, I mean, I would have to imagine there's like sedation. Maybe they use some hypnotics. They might use ketamine. I don't know. But in a... I had heard that once. I do know, I know a number of people who were on the verge of blowing their heads off who with competent, supervised uh, ketamine-assisted therapy. I mean, literally within one or two sessions, we're able to say, I don't know what I was so upset about. Like, I can't even believe believe I was so wound up about that. And that's incredible. It's not a indefinite fix. But to answer your question, to come back, like there are cases in which I think it makes sense to have some type of maintenance dose, right? So let's just say you're able to strip out a bunch of the hallucinogenic or psychedelic effects from LSD, and it remains incredibly effective for cluster headaches, which is actually one indication. And the best combination of effect and minimizing side effects is to have like some small dose four or five days a week. Great. Fantastic. 
But if you're trying to process or contend with some type of childhood trauma that has been plaguing your automatic behaviors and maybe addictions, perhaps you know, self destructive or otherwise destructive behaviors, then I don't know if what we need is a maintenance drug. There may be more psychological surgery required for that, in which case perhaps the content does play a meaningful role. I happen to believe that's the case in in many instances. But 10 years from now, yeah, psychedelics is going to be crazy because it it's subject to these market forces and these incentives. So, you know, don't ask a barber if you need a haircut kind of situation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you go to an orthopedic surgeon and you're like, do I need surgery? They're not all going to say you need surgery, but they have a certain incentive to do surgery. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, and so realizing that in advance is, is important. But I, I do think what we will find through the study of psychedelics is even if psychedelics as compounds were to disappear 10 years from now, let's just say, let's just say they go back to being, they are reclassified, rescheduled, right? And then all over the place. And then who knows, like some Senator's kid jumps off a balcony and then the whole thing goes kaput and it's thrown back into psychedelic scientific winter. Even if that's the case within the next 10 to 15 years, I think we will learn so many new things about the functioning of the mind and processing of trauma, metabolizing of difficult experience and issues such as treatment resistant depression, complex PTSD, that the treatment paradigms will shift even if the compounds disappear, which I don't think they will. And I also think there are so many indications that do not require high doses of psychedelics, which will be well treated with lower doses of psychedelics. So I'm excited to, to see what bears out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else you want to cover? I think that's it for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm good as well. It was awesome. Yeah. It's good to see you, brother. Yeah. Good to see you too, man. Thanks for, thanks for having me over for dinner. Yeah. Sitting on our, our couch here. Mr. Toast is in the background for those watching the audience. Yeah. Yeah. 12 and doing well. Yeah. Passed out. So, you know, not that long. Well, it is, I mean, it is long ago, not in like historical uh, evolutionary terms, but in like our lifetime terms a while ago, like we had a, we had a shot very much like this in San Francisco in one of your, like, I don't want to say first apartments, but uh, shitty apartment. ear, earlier apartments with a couch like this and toast walked by as a puppy and chewed through one of these audio cables. XLR cables. Yeah, totally. <laughs> back then I had a little bit of hair. That's right. I think yeah, yeah. it crazy that you yeah. had hair back then. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. Somebody was asking me, they're like, yeah, but you could probably figure out how to regrow hair. And I'm like, yeah, but if I just suddenly like disappeared for six months and then reappeared with like a huge mop on my head, I mean, <laughs> I mean that's what Elon Musk did. Did you see the early Elon Musk pictures where he was oh, bald? I have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you could do it. I could do it, but I, A, I don't, I don't feel the need. B, I just think, especially from my friends, I would get so much endless shit. Do you think you should do it? Dar Vladis and Daria right now. She said no. 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 Yeah, yeah, it's Tim Tim. Yeah, yeah no. Mr. Clean. I've grown into the Mr. Clean look. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good with it. Uh, all right, brother. All right. We'll do this again in a few months. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. See more of each other in person. All right. Peace. Peace.